I tried to imagine a fellow smarter than myself, and then I tried to think, what would he do? Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, neurotropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. I'm your host, Jesse Lawler, excited to bring you episode number 69 in this podcast dedicated to the betterment of your own brain by any and all means at your disposal. This is the long-awaited Ritalin episode. It's hard to imagine that we've actually gone for over two years now without yet having an episode dedicated to Ritalin, which is probably one of the more famous drugs in the world and certainly uh, more famous cognitive enhancers. And yet we're just getting to it now. I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Jahangir Sunderji, whom you may remember as the doctor who we spoke with also about Adderall probably about nine months ago when he was first on the show. So we're going to be talking about Ritalin and kind of stimulant style cognitive enhancers in general and some of the pros and cons that go along with those. One of the things I really like about Dr. Sunderji is that he doesn't mind making strong statements both on the pro and the con side of the fence for things. And you'll hear a lot of that in the interview to come. If you hang around until the end of the episode, I'm going to tell you about the most juvenile use of neurofeedback technology that I've ever heard of and how you too can wear this thing on your bottom. Yes, I, I really did say that. But hang around till the end to hear what I'm talking about. But before we get to any of that, let's do This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts, This Week in Neuroscience. So a couple of months ago, we had the marijuana episode, and you'll remember that we talked about endocannabinoids, which are the naturally occurring compounds created by the body that are suspiciously similar to some of the phytochemicals inside the marijuana plant, to the extent that the body compounds were actually named after the plant rather than vice versa. So the major naturally occurring cannabinoid in our brain is something called anandamide, which is taken from the Sanskrit word ananda, which means bliss, and not surprisingly, feels kind of nice to have in our brains. Anyway, there's a really interesting op-ed article in a recent New York Times about anandamide and about an enzyme called FAAH, which all of us make more or less of, but there's apparently a lucky subset of the population that has a beneficial mutation, which causes them to have a little less FAAH than your average Joe, and FAAH, it turns out, deactivates anandamide and thus reduces our level of endemic bliss that we feel on a moment-to-moment basis. Basis. Anyway, this article is written by a doctor and he's talking about kind of the, the unfairness of the genetic lottery as far as how susceptible some of us are or aren't to cannabis and other forms of addiction. He references specifically a patient of his who's a long-term marijuana user to deal with his own high levels of anxiety because taking exogenous cannabinoids from something like the marijuana plant can make up for a lack of endogenous cannabinoids. So there's really interesting parts of this article talking about people who have this positive mutation that gives them less FAAH and thus more anandamide in their system also tend to not really enjoy marijuana and use it a lot less, get addicted even less, because basically marijuana is giving them something they've already got enough of already and there's not really much upside for them in it. Whereas people that live on the other end of the spectrum, the bell-shaped curve, and have lower than average levels of anandamide are craving all the exogenous cannabinoids that they can possibly get. Really interesting article. I'll throw up a link and it's definitely worth giving a read. In the audience feedback department, I would like to give a hat tip thank you to Pete Aboard a Unicycle, great username, who left a five-star review on iTunes for this podcast, saying, among other things, I love how info-packed the episodes are and what length Jesse is willing to go to for improvement's sake. The dude starved himself to ward off cancer. I will continue listening and trying doable ideas I get from this show. I'd also like to throw an official thank you to friend of the Smart Drug Smarts family, Brad English, who sent me a screen capture of him tipping off a bunch of his friends about the podcast. I believe this is on the Facebook app, although I can't be sure, but I love hearing that we're percolating through the internet, and thank you for all of you who are spreading the word by hook or by crook. Also, speaking of the starvation thing and the follow-on ketogenic diet that I was doing, I've got to come clean that my plan on the ketogenic diet thing did not exactly go as planned. I'll go into this at greater length later, and I do intend to really reattempt that experiment. But my initial foray was a failure. I was eating too much protein, apparently. I really did cut out almost all carbs. But to really stay in deep ketosis, apparently, even protein can kind of kick you out of it because your body can use something called gluconeogenesis to deconstruct sugars out of protein molecules. And so I was eating a lot of fish when apparently I should have been eating a lot of sticks of butter or something like that. I mean, it's, it's really ridiculous how, uh, how much fat you need to have in your macronutrient ratio, apparently, to maintain a ketogenic body state. So 
I'm going to give it a go later, but when my blood measurements confirmed that I'd been out of ketosis for at least a couple of days, I gave up the ghost on it. I hadn't had any fruit for over a month at that point, and I'm a fruit guy. I've, I've always been a fruit guy, and I missed my fruit, and I figured, well, shucks, I'm out of ketosis anyway. And so over the past week, I've eaten just an obscene, embarrassing amount of fruit. I'm like a fruit vendor's wet dream, leaving a trail of banana peels with people slipping behind me. It's, it's ridiculous. But further ketogenic experiment to be done in the future. I don't have an exact time scheduled for when I'm going to get back on that wagon. I probably will need to reintroduce dairy into my diet. Long story. Anyway, I don't, I don't want to go into that now, but that's the update on ketosis. One last little tidbit. I got pinged from a couple different directions this week about do-it-yourself biohacking communities, local organizations that are taking a lot of different approaches to citizen science and biohacking. I'm going to follow up on these emails. I might have a whole episode devoted to this in the near future, or at the very least, throw up a couple of cool links in the next episode. So stay tuned for that. And as usual, thanks to everybody that sent in recommendations through the suggestion box on the website or otherwise. Definitely helps to have lots of people's ears to the ground and eyes to the web and all that stuff as far as keeping us informed on the latest and the greatest and what's going on in neuroscience and biohacking. So thanks for the input and keep it coming. Smart Drug Smarts. So Ritalin, probably one of the most recognized brand names as far as a pharmaceutical product of anything I can think of, you know, right up there with Xanax and Tylenol and stuff like that. The actual drug name is methylphenidate. And what you're about to hear is a doctor, Dr. Sunderji, who has prescribed this to lots of people over the years and has strong opinions both on the pros and cons of this particular substance. We've talked about this in dribs and drabs on different episodes. I think most recently in the Cantab episode, Ritalin was one of the drugs that they found distinct cognitive of benefits for, but as you'll hear, there's also some some real potential physical downsides. So as with so many things, there's sort of the the teeter-totter analogy. You push something up, something else might go down. So listen carefully for both the pros and the cons in the interview that's coming up. Now, fair warning, I've never actually tried Ritalin myself. I've got some friends that have and have generally had pretty positive things to say, but kind of as you'll hear in the interview, the short-term acute benefits are pretty apparent and a lot of the negative consequences, as is so often the case, are things that could crop up years later or take place very slowly and So definitely some interesting dilemmas whether to consider Ritalin as a cognitive enhancer that you yourself might be interested in. But let's dive in with Dr. Sunderji. Ritalin is a chemical compound called methylphenidate, which is a mixture of two amphetamine salts. It, differently than Adderall, blocks what is called the DAT dopamine transporter in the presynaptic neurons, preventing reabsorption of primarily dopamine, but it has some norepinephrine effects, but I think of it as primarily dopaminergic and increases the concentration of dopamine in the synaptic cleft that way and generally functions as a stimulant, as amphetamines do. It's used generally to treat ADHD, can also be used to treat narcolepsy. A long time ago, there was some stated use it for weight loss or regulation, but that was ineffective and is not done anymore. There has been some other medically indicated but technically off-label use in using Ritalin to treat mostly depression, but sometimes cases of dementia or other cognitive difficulties. And it's been around for quite a number of decades now. I was reading that it was actually 1955 that was first approved for early use by the FDA. So we've got over 50 years of history with this one. Yes, it was, I think, created by the, the pharmaceutical company that is now Novartis. I believe the chemist's wife was a narcoleptic or had some kind of medical comorbidity or complication, and he synthesized it for her and then actually named it after her. You know, it actually, I think, on par, it's a better, safer, more appropriate drug to treat cognitive attentional disorders than Adderall. That's great that you mentioned that. I was going to ask for kind of the uh, compare contrast between those two drugs and being similar as far as what the general public thinks of those two kind of going hand in hand. That's interesting. You know, if we look at the clinical population, you know, people who have been tested for and exhibit true signs of ADHD, 25% of people like Ritalin better and respond to Ritalin better. 25% of people respond better to Adderall. And 50% of those clinical people in the population 
it doesn't make a difference. Adderall has higher rates of abuse and diversion, which, you know, is when people give their prescribed medication away to others or sell it or other kinds of things like that. Ritalin, that's less of a problem. You know, Ritalin does not have as much of the quote-unquote charge feeling that Adderall does. It's not, its effects are not quite as noticeable and dramatic as Adderall in terms of a psychological experience. It's subtler. A lot of my patients that are, in my opinion, properly dosed on Ritalin kind of don't even really notice that they're taking it, but their task performance and social behavior and things that require attention are dramatically better. Immediate release Ritalin will reach a steady state effective strength, I'd say in one to two hours sometimes 30 minutes. People have different levels of metabolism of the drug. Route of administration is also a factor in that. Nowadays, you know, if you use a medication, let's say that's extended release, which is a more common, safer version of methylphenidate, something like Concerta, it tends to build up more slowly in the bloodstream um, and can be released in different waves or pulses. Certain extended release formulations of methylphenidate exhibits what we call kind of a double hump or a camel-like Uh, concentration curve in which there'll be peaks of concentration, you know, in hours two to three and in hours five to six. Immediate release formulation of Ritalin, if you crushed it up, you'd feel it, I'd say 15 to 30 minutes. If you swallowed it whole, I would say 30 minutes to two hours. Um, Again, it depends on the dose. These are drugs that are metabolized in the liver by CYP450 enzymes. People have different levels and strengths of those. Your levels are different than mine. And these levels of enzymes change over time and depend on what other kinds of medications, food, alcohol, sleep, diet, uh, we have going on. So there's quite a bit of variability to it. I was reading that for children that are prescribed Ritalin that are on the ADHD spectrum, that it can actually have beneficial morphological effects for the brain during development, but that for misdiagnosed children, it can actually have negative impacts. Can you talk a little about that? So in an ADHD brain, you actually have lower cortical volume. Their brains are smaller. In an untreated ADHD brain, the cortical volume as the brain develops will continue to show a wider differential volume over time. A corrected ADHD brain and somebody who actually has the disorder, their cortical volume will begin to reach that of a, a child without the disorder because the dopaminergic activity has been balanced to sustain neuronal activity and and life. If you take somebody who doesn't need the drug and you give them a stimulant in this dopamine reuptake blocker, it will cause an overstimulation and something called excitotoxicity. The neuron just burns out, shoots too much dopamine across the synaptic cleft. There's too much received by the postsynaptic neuron. The voltage in that cell is too high to be sustained and the neuron dies. So you said there's less habit-forming potential for Ritalin than for Adderall. That's a good question. I think some of that has to do with the fact that it's been around longer and we know how to use it better. Most of the formulations of extended or sustained release Ritalin have tamper-resistant properties and that if you crush it up, it becomes inert. Adderall, in the way it is formulated, is much more susceptible to to being tampered with and therefore can be given more in a concentrated way and therefore abused. You're just going to get a a more extreme shot of it. In addition, just the psychological experience of being on Ritalin is more subtle. Adderall, people like it because the marketing has made it sexier. People have a psychological expectation that they will feel something for it, and then they do. In users that and patients that take it, they report kind of more of a charge or a jolt when they take Adderall versus Ritalin. How much Ritalin use out there is legitimate prescribed use versus the gray market of somebody getting a prescription and selling it to their friends at university or something like that? Hard to say because so much of it comes from abroad. 
so much Ritalin that we find in emergency rooms it originates in India or China or we have no idea where. Data that indicates you know, how much Ritalin there is that is prescribed in the U.S. does not match, you know, one, it doesn't match the prescription fill, the prescriptions filled, not everyone fills their prescriptions. And two, we just, you know, there are just more people on it than it's possible for patients to be seen by prescribers of Ritalin. So that would indicate that a lot of it is being used in, in a gray market or underground way. Now, you mentioned emergency rooms there, which I guess raises the question of extreme adverse reactions and overdoses and things like that. Can you talk a little about the dangers of Ritalin R? Ritalin's a stimulant, so it's going to increase blood pressure. Therefore, it can cause strokes. It can cause seizures. Um, it can cause heart arrhythmias. Um, it can overtax the liver and cause liver failure. It can cause psychosis in people that have an underlying predisposition to mood instability, it can cause a bipolar mania. Because it is a dopaminergic substance, it can trigger the addictive circuitry in the brain and exacerbate addictions to other substances, including opiates and marijuana and anything, alcohol and anything anybody can become hooked on. That's interesting to me. Can you veer off a little into how that would work, how taking one drug could make you more likely to get hooked on another? It's about the rush. If you take too much of something, let's say, you know, someone went to a club and did a bunch of cocaine and they get the rush on that. And let's say there's somebody who that that person, they're kind of drug of choice or, or party drug that they most prefer is alcohol, it's going to turn on the craving for that other substance and you're going to consume more of it, not just because the addiction circuitry has been turned on, but also because the dopamine rush is lowering your inhibitions. And then that kind of is a feed forward cycle. The manufacture of these timed release capsules are specifically made to prevent things like crushing it up so it can be powdered and things like that. Is that going to be the same with Ritalin that's coming from an overseas source? Is it possible that people that are taking gray market Ritalin don't necessarily have these same protections on the actual manufacture of the capsule that they're getting access to? I would think profit motives probably drive what they do there since they're not subject to regulation and control. Maybe they're subject to some of their own reputational branding. They'll have some integrity about what they're making, but I think the market is probably going to demand drugs that are instant release. Using the polymer kind of coding technology is not cheap. It adds a layer of production and is a more expensive product. You know, if you're just a generic pharmaceutical company in India, you're trying to keep your costs low and your revenue high. Somebody who's getting an insurance-covered extended release version of the medication is a different consumer than somebody's paying out of their pocket. And somebody's paying out of their pocket probably doesn't want an extended release thing. And so probably if you're getting it from overseas, it's not going to be tamper resistant. I was thinking about that, particularly as far as if somebody is trying to uh, figure out what a, a dosage should be and they're thinking, well, you know, a doctor would prescribe X number of milligrams and they take the same X number of milligrams in a non-extended release you know, capsule I get from elsewhere, it could be a very different effect. Let's talk about dosing. Dosing is a very interesting subject. I have been a very big proponent in my practice of all medications of microdosing. I think people in general are over-medicated and you can go to far of too fast very easily on all of these things. You know, it's like cooking. If you pick the right spice, you only need a little bit. If you pick the wrong one, people just end up doubling down until disaster happens. ADHD drugs are very interesting. The microdosing philosophy in the realm of ADHD drugs comes from the reality that a large percentage of people who are prescribed Ritalin are not truly ADHD, but are receiving cognitive benefit from it. That microdosing philosophy is very, very appropriate for these people because they do, even at low doses, become dependent on taking these types of stimulants and, you know, learn to function on them and do not function well without them, which creates an interesting clinical category of almost Ritalin dependent people th that don't have symptoms that rise to the level of ADHD. Another way we look at it is sort of 
ADHD that's been caused by the medication that treats ADHD, which is kind of ridiculous, but American medicine is kind of ridiculous. I just returned from the Mass General ADHD conference, and until only a few years ago, adult ADHD was not even recognized. And the dosing regimens we have, and in most, virtually all of the studies have exclusively been done on children. And all of the dosing guides I have seen to date, including the ones presented at the conference, were dosing guides for children. It is interesting and notable that the approved dosing of extended release and even immediate release formulations of Ritalin products are higher for children than for adults. What we're beginning to find is that adults with true ADHD are under-recognized they have lower functioning as their, than their abilities would indicate. And even when they are treated, their dosing is not optimized. And the evidence at this point would suggest that they should actually be on much higher doses than most of us are giving them. There's also a, a big problem of uh, tachyphylaxis or just becoming resistant or dependent on the medication methylphenidate in this case, and it doesn't have the desired effect anymore, you end up continuing having to increase the dose, which sounds okay. You just turn the number up when you feel okay, but the rest of your body doesn't like it. And this is when cardiac arrhythmias occur and adrenal fatigue can occur and higher rates of bone turnover and long-term osteoporosis, scoliosis, you know, elevated blood pressure and all kinds of other complications can occur. Um, I make my dosing decisions with a, a long view in mind, a 30, 40 year time perspective. So I have more room to turn the dose up over time longitudinally instead of just going for broke early and leaving a patient subject to the potential for overdosing, in my opinion, and, and medical complications down the road. For some drugs like caffeine, I guess, is an example of something where a person's, if you go for something like three weeks without caffeine, if you're a caffeine virgin again, and you can kind of start to uh, get perked up by a cup of coffee the way that you did when you were 11 years old or something. What's the situation with a drug like Ritalin? I think for people who aren't truly ADHD, this concept of taking a tolerance break works quite well. Similar to caffeine, you can become kind of a Ritalin virgin again. For people with clinically significant ADHD, that isn't so true. If, you know, somebody needs the equivalent of 30 milligrams long-acting methylphenidate a day, and we give them a drug holiday, as we often do in children, because another one of the negative effects of Ritalin is it reduces growth. And children who are chronically on Ritalin have lower stature, they're shorter and don't weigh as much. And so we do give them summers off, weekends off, so they can have catch-up growth. Um, but then when school starts again, they usually need to be on the same effective dose or really a weight-corrected dose, which is how we dose these things, especially in children. And that tolerance principle does not apply. But it's more about monitoring you know, really potent psychoactive substances that really ought to be watched carefully because they can end up in the hands of different people. I have a case that I often say of medication diversion. I mean, look, I, I'm a realistic, pragmatic person. I, I know pretty much any college kid in America can get their hands on Adderall before the end of this interview. But there was one patient who did that kind of thing, gave it to another patient who had an underlying glaucoma. And, you know, that, that individual almost went blind and lost some eyesight because of the, raise, the rise in intraocular pressure and blood pressure. And there's no way people know that or or that you know that it's a physician really has to check you out and watch these things carefully um, to make sure things don't go awry. And the sad thing is, once they do go awry, then it's sort of the Pandora's box has been opened. I've seen cases of psychosis get tipped over because of Ritalin use. I've seen really severe bipolar manias in the last few weeks get tipped into activity because of Ritalin use, even at low doses. I've seen alcoholic binges reach levels where people had to be hospitalized because 
of the you know, activation of addiction circuitry with Ritalin use, even at low doses. You know, I'm talking about regular people deciding they want to go out and party using 5, 10 milligrams of Ritalin and getting themselves into big time trouble with alcohol. Sort of disaster scenarios that you've mentioned here, were these all unprescribed, unmonitored, off-label use that you found out about because something went horribly wrong? Or were any of these actual prescribed uses of Ritalin that just went awry? They were both. And more often, the disaster scenarios are because, you know, they're illicit, you know, they're getting it from somewhere else. But I have definitely had people in my practice, seen people in the emergency room who, you know, maybe have even been stable on Ritalin for years and for whatever reason decided to overdose it. They may even innocently have been prescribed another medication, like an antibiotic or something, by a practitioner who didn't check the drug interactions. It affected the same liver enzymes that metabolized the Ritalin. The side effect was the Ritalin blood levels were higher, and then that triggered the negative effects and disease states. So sometimes these things really can happen for a lot of of strange reasons. I mean, the, the most bizarre one actually is grapefruit. Grapefruit is this bizarre thing that we all learn in medical school because it turns off a lot of CYP450 enzymes in the liver and can increase drug concentrations of a whole bunch of different things. For women listening to this broadcast out there, consumption of too much grapefruit can actually deactivate your birth control pills. I was reading that there was actually just this year, already in 2015, there was a meta-analysis of evidence of therapeutic doses of amphetamine and methylphenidate that resulted in some really positive performance improvement on working memory, episodic memory, and inhibitory control in normal, healthy adult humans. Can you talk about some of the the smart drugs aspect of Ritalin, like the cognitive benefits that a normal human might see? Yeah, I mean, be Barry Bonds, take steroids, hit more home runs, same difference. Yeah, these are cognitive enhancers, you know, like Adderall and Modafinil and a few others that are in the pipeline. And yeah, people's performance on cognitive tasks, their you know accuracy of and breadth of working memory, speed, accuracy are all going to be better. A meta-analysis showing Ritalin improves all of these performance measures. I'm shocked that so many were funded because the the answer is so evident. You know, it's going to give you an edge. It just is. I think on balance, it's probably safer than some of the alternatives on the market, but it has a lot of the same risks. I think people don't appreciate fully the risk of what this stuff is you know it just people tend to have a a positive view on its performance enhancing effects and have more of a short-term view on what they're ingesting but they're not really thinking about okay because i take this and i'm 14 in high school i'm actually going to be two inches shorter than i should have been You know, because I'm taking, you know, double what I'm supposed to be taking, you know, even as an appropriately prescribed ADHD patient at, say, age 25, their blood pressure is going to be uncontrollable at age 55, and they're going to have to be on three blood pressure medications. You know, somebody who's slight, not eating enough, maybe even likes the fact that Ritalin suppresses appetite, may not, and like that for whatever cosmetic societal pressures you know, may not really be fully aware of the fact that their osteoporosis risk increases exponentially because of this. It's just something to think about. It's all a trade-off. It's school is competitive, work is competitive. There's a lot of these cognitive enhancers out there. The show is smart drug smarts. It's, you know, you're going to make your own decisions, but just know what what it is you're doing, positive and negative. And the rest, I guess, is up to you. Smart Drug Smarts. So thank you very, very much to Dr. Sundarji for taking the time for that interview. I must admit, I remember thinking during the interview while we were talking and also having re-listened to it now that I I felt like I was being ping-ponged as far as my emotions towards Ritalin over the course of the interview, like something you would say would make it sound so darn appealing and then something else would just be like, wait, oh no, major red flag, red flag. And uh, while I can't say that makes the decision process any easier, it definitely at least makes for an exciting conversation. I'm sure that many of the listeners will 
will have Ritalin experience, past, present, or future. And if you've got thoughts on Ritalin and want to share them with me and or the rest of the Smart Drug Smarts community, definitely feel free. Drop an email to jesse at smartdrugsmarts.com and let me know about your experiences. I'm curious myself. And needless to say, should I go forward and do a Ritalin self-experiment at any point, I'll definitely let you guys know how that goes, how it feels, etc. But now... The as promised, extremely silly, ruthless listener retention gimmick. Smart drug smarts. Ruthless listener retention gimmick. So every now and then you see something that just makes you feel like a real stick in the mud curmudgeon. And you think, wait a minute, there are still people that are starving on this planet. How come people are bothering to invent that stuff? And that's kind of a stupid attitude. And I mean, I admit that. But on the other hand, I I feel it sometimes. And I I did feel it when somebody forwarded me the NeuroWare brain controlled tail, which apparently is from a Japanese company. If you're into Hello Kitty and you're into high tech stuff and you want to have some loose reading of your brainwaves translate into motor activity in a little motor controlled foxtail that you wear, you know, just above your butt crack, then then this is the product for you. This is apparently a little headgear gadget. We'll read your brainwaves, transmit that over Bluetooth to the little motor controlled tail that you wear. And uh, you need to be careful if you you couldn't really necessarily like ride a bicycle with this. You'll you'll want to have tails on your shirt or something to hide the little attachment point on your belt or whatever. But but yeah, if, if you feel like having a little foxtail that that wags occasionally when you're in a good mood, this possibility now exists. And it pairs with a mobile app, of course, that will put you on a map when you're in a good mood and sort of show a little icon of where your tail is wagging. And if you're in a negative mood, it'll show a little negative icon. So you can gather around all your fake tail wearing friends and party or commiserate with one another as the case may be. Should you wish to get me anything for my birthday or similar holidays, uh, do, do not buy this for me. But should you wish to see a silly little two minute video of a Japanese girl in a automatically waving foxtail, well, then there will be a link on Smart Drug Smarts for that. Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast so smart. We have smart in our title, twice. So that is the entire episode. If you liked what you heard, as usual, I would implore you to tell a friend with a brain about this podcast and see if they like it as well. The show notes for this episode will be online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com, along with all the relevant links, and I will be back at you next Friday. Rhiannon is making a big stink about publishing on exactly the same day every week, so I think we're going to actually try to do that and see if we can corral me into a regular sort of production schedule. So tentatively put Friday in your calendar, and I will be back at you with the same unflagging commitment to helping you fine-tune the performance of your own brain. Have a great week and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smarts should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.